Last year, I designed my very own home theater speakers. They're based off the Klipsch KL650s, and the project was a huge success. In fact, not only did I build them, but a lot of you guys built them as well, and you told me on the forum how much you loved those speakers. And although the speakers were good, I always feel like there's areas that we can improve upon. And by improving those areas, I came up with the Cinema 6. And that's what you're going to see me build today. So let's go ahead and take a look at it and see what areas we did actually improve upon. Let's get building. At first glance, it's going to look like version 1 is almost identical to version 2, at least from the front. But if you really look closely, you're going to notice a few differences. The first being that the waveguide is actually centered on the two woofers. And instead of one port, now we have two ports, one on either side of the woofers. All of this is to help with off-axis response. Originally with version 1, the tweeter was offset on the woofers. Now this was a design that I picked up from the original Klipsch that I saw and just wanted to kind of replicate that. But in reality, when the waveguide is centered on those woofers, you're going to get a much more even response, which allows you to have better placement options. And by centering the waveguide, it allows for a lot more flexibility when we're talking about placement options. Now besides the six normal sides that I cut out on the table saw, there's one other thing that I need, which is a center brace. Now this is that center brace. You're gonna notice it has kind of a unique shape. It does have a half circle on one side, and there's a reason for that. That actually goes towards the back of the cabinet, which you'll see a little bit later. And the reason why it goes to the rear of the cabinet is so that I don't have to off-center my terminal cup. I can put it right in the center, and this circle allows me to get to all of my connections without having to finagle through anything or cut something later. Now, the other side, you'll notice, is uh, on either the top and the bottom of it, are there's no holes cut in it. And there's a reason for that, too. That's because that's going to become the side of the port, which you'll see later as well. So I left a little bit of area there. That way I can run that center brace right along the side of the port and use that as a side for the port. I don't have to worry about adding more material to that. And I always say, whenever you're designing something like this, try to keep those things in mind because it'll make your job a lot easier when you assemble. Now let's go ahead and start assembling the box. For this, I'm gonna want the front, the brace, the sides, and the top and bottom. I don't need the rear right now, so let's get gluing. And the gluing's done. Well, not the back side. I might have forgot to get video when I was gluing this up, but you've seen a box glued together. You don't have to really worry about it. I'll show you some tips and tricks when we spin it around the back side. Now it might look like the brace is in, but it's actually not. This was just used as a spacer when it was glued together. Now it's time to glue this in. And the placement of this is what I consider pretty important. It does want to be closely centered, but we also want a side for those ports and we don't necessarily want to make something new. So what we're going to do is line it up with the side of those ports. Now if your brace isn't going in, in the famous words of Happy Gilmore, also known as Adam Sandler, just tap it in. Tap, tap, tap it in. And if you don't get that reference, you need to be watching a little bit of Happy Gilmore. And then you can thank me later. Now 
Now that I know everything is nice and square, it's time to show you some actual gluing. Now this gluing is going to be coming from a mustard bottle, but don't let that confuse you. It is actually wood glue. It's type bond type two, and I'll link that in the description. But I have found that mustard bottles like this used are very good vessels to pour your glue out, and they save you a little bit of money from having to get something like a glue bot. Although, they can be a little messy, like you can see here. You'll notice I didn't just clamp the back on, I also clamped the front to the brace through the speaker holes. Now we do have the glue in the ports. One side of the port is of course the brace, but the other side we do have to get a little piece of three quarter inch material and add it there. I thought I would just go ahead and clamp that in. Ended up that I just nailed it in, just made it a lot easier, and then clamped the upper piece on there to make the whole port. You'll notice I didn't tape off the ports before I started painting them. In this case, I painted them a blue because I didn't have any black on hand. There's really no reason to tape this off. You can just sand it with your sander after you're done. Real quick sand will get all that off. I did go ahead and put some acoustic foam in here. Now there's gonna be a lot more by the time I finish. One thing you'll notice though, is that there is no foam near the ports, not even on the back wall. I don't wanna restrict any airflow going to the ports. So I leave that wide open without any foam. Now, before we get the final assembly, let's go ahead and talk about the changes I made on this. The first thing I did is I wanted to change out the compression driver. Now, the JBL D220Ti is what I used to use, and it is pretty good for the price, but I felt like there was better out there. And so I searched and talked to some industry experts, and it was pretty much consensus that the DE250-8 by BNC is one of the best out there. And for the price, you really can't go wrong. It's only $111. Now there was a little bit of a problem with this. It's not able to actually use the same waveguide as before. And because of that, I had to look for a new waveguide. Now I chose the Eminence by radio waveguide. Now this is a really nice waveguide and it does give me the coverage that I want. It's 90 by 50. Meaning when you place this horizontally, you're gonna get 90 degrees horizontal off axis and 50 degrees vertical off axis. Now, if you were to flip it on its side, you're gonna get the opposite of that. That means the speaker could actually be flipped on its side if you want that narrow sound stage. That's really good for people with long, small rooms. So after I got those parts in, I had to go ahead and take some measurements. Now that the box is done, I can take those measurements in the box, which is always the best thing to do when you're designing a speaker. So once I got everything installed in the box, I went ahead and took some measurements. Now this is of the compression driver. Now this is amazing. This is that compression driver, the BNC DE250-8, inside that waveguide in that box. And I gotta say, this is a phenomenal reading. I'm just really happy with the way it came out. Now this is a five decibel scale. So this is 105, this is 110. All the way down from, I don't know, what is it? 870, 900 hertz, let's say 900 hertz. Let's say 900 hertz to 17 kilohertz or so. Maybe 17 and a half kilohertz is within that five decibel scale, which is just 
really good. I mean, it's just really well behaved, already really flat. Now, I know we can get it even flatter, but if you really take a look at it, I mean, even from 1.2 kilohertz to 17, I mean, what is this? 100 and we'll just say like 107 decibels to what, 105. So that's like a two decibel uh, scale right there. I mean, that's just really good. So let's go ahead and work on uh, the crossover. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I wanted to do with the crossover. The first thing that I wanted to do was make sure that we could keep the crossover linear. Uh, and I wanted to also really work on this end and bring it down as hard as I can. Uh, so I did a third order crossover here. Now by doing a third order crossover, it does a couple things. One, I can cross over uh, later. In this particular case, we cross over about 1.2 kilohertz. Now by doing that, it allows me to get a sharp angle on uh, the tweeter, which gives us a significantly better distortion profile. All of our distortion is significantly down at the crossover point and further, uh, which is great. It gives us a very clean sounding speaker. It also allows the woofers to cross over sooner. Now, the woofers in general, when they go further over to cross over, two things happen. One, they start beaming, which means that you get a narrowing of the sound stage. Uh, and two, they also start having a rising distortion. So if we can cross those over sooner, we can uh, get rid of both those things once again, making a better sounding speaker and a wider sound stage. And guess what? We were able to do that. So when I put uh, the woofers on here and I start uh, working that, uh, once again, that is also a third order on the woofers. Uh, we just have a very flat response. Now you'll notice after 500 hertz or so, you're gonna start to notice this kind of going up and down right here, really in this 300 hertz range. That's all in room, okay? This is an in room response. This is all room related. It's really not uh, important. Uh, that can easily be EQ'd down with your surround sound receiver if you need to. But it's really hard to say how your room's going to respond. Your room might respond differently than mine. But overall, very flat response. And even if that wasn't a, a room node, which it is, um, you're still almost within that, you know, that five decibel pan, which is just crazy. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the uh, final response and see what that looks like. Now it is also an in-room response. So this is the final frequency response in room. And I gotta say, it is very impressive. Once again, we're in a five decibel scale and it's just phenomenal what it looks like, uh, especially from 500 Hertz on up. I mean, you have really no issues at all. It's just really, really good. And it's good to about 17.5 kilohertz. After that, it does drop off like a cliff, which most compression drivers do. Now on the low end, uh, it's going to look a little wonky. That's just because of the in-room response. And I didn't add the ports in here. But if you run like something like Odyssey, it's going to cross these over around 60 hertz. And I typically would tell you to cross these over between 60 and 80 hertz. I guess you could cross them over a little higher if you wanted to, but there's no reason to. Having said that, these are designed still to be used with a subwoofer. Of course, they are designed for home theater, so you're going to be using a subwoofer. They're not full range speakers, but that's what makes them so crystal clear. And I got to say, I really am in love with these speakers. All right, it's time for final assembly. Now, you're going to notice that my crossover is already in here and it's already soldered together. Don't do this unless you have already tested it outside the box, okay? Now, it might have all been tested. If you don't know why you don't want to do that, you might want to check it out. My patrons already know, but just for some of you guys to get you in the know, you might get a bad component. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about that, go and check out my patron page. Now, I will tell you this as well. Uh, if this is your very first time designing your own speaker and you're designing it from scratch, you're not actually building this particular speaker, you're going to want to make sure as well to take your on and off axis responses as well. Uh, I've already done that. I did this before I finalized the crossover, but you want to make sure that your simulation is lining up uh, with your response that you think you're going to be getting. And you also want to make sure that your off axis response is good too. You don't want to just assume that because your on axis is good, your off axis is, because if you don't have that in phase, it's not going to be. Luckily, this one is. All right, so now that the build is complete, I have built three of these and I love them. They are my front soundstage. Now, I think that these are some of the best theater speakers that you can build for this price. Uh, maybe even the best. I, I don't know. I haven't built all the theater speakers in this price range, but I really like these. They are very, very clear and you hear things that you don't typically hear. And that's what I really like about it. Now, one of the things that I find to be sounding really good is Tron Legacy. Now, when I turn Tron Legacy on, 
uh, there's a part where they're riding the light cycles. I'm sure you guys know that scene, which sounds phenomenal as is. But one of the scenes, uh, the guy falls off his bike and loses his thing. And he makes a couple grunts as he's falling. And then, of course, when uh, he gets killed, he makes another grunt. And those are things that I don't remember ever hearing before, but they were very clear on these. Even Saving Private Ryan, some of the voices that are going off in the Beach of Normandy scenes, I can clearly make out what they're saying, which in times with other speakers, I've had a hard time doing. Even my father, who's hard of hearing, I hope he's not watching because he doesn't want us to know that, he can actually listen to these speakers and make out what's being said. So overall, I think they're very, very good speakers. And if you're looking for something very clear and something that you don't need a lot of power to push, uh, I think the Cinema 6 should be something that you should look at. Go ahead and check us out on the forum and give us your thoughts and opinions on these. We'd love to hear them. And don't forget to write some comments down below. Now, if it's the first time viewing here, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell. That way you get instant notification. Don't forget to like the video. All right, guys, I'm Toyd's DIY Audio. And I'm out.